Hello, and thank you for joining us. Today, Joyce will be teaching a spirit-filled message entitled, What Would Jesus Think? All right, we're going to do our concluding teaching in this series on the battlefield of the mind. And uh, I think the series has gone really well so far. This morning, we're going to talk about what would Jesus think? Go to Romans chapter 8, verse 6. Father, we thank you for the word today, and we believe it's going to impact people's lives. Shake everybody up, wake them up, and get them ready to just receive, receive, receive. You know, we have two minds, and I think that's one of the things that gets confusing sometimes. The Bible actually says we have two minds. We have a mind of the flesh, and we have a mind of the spirit. You can think first one thing and then think another. In verse 6 it says, The mind of the flesh, and I love this, is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit. In other words, the mind of the flesh is just what I can come up with. It's kind of like, did you ever ask somebody something and they say, well, off the top of my head. Well, who wants something off the top of somebody's head? I don't, you know. I can get that from myself. It says, the mind of the, of the flesh, which is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit, is death. Death that comprises all the miseries arising from sin, both here and hereafter. So I think it's fair to say that if we live in the mind of the flesh, or we think according to the flesh, that we're going to experience every kind of misery known to man. We started this out on Thursday night, trying to open up the thought to people that some of the messes in your life are attached to the mess in your mind. That if you can get your mind renewed, then you'll also begin to experience the new life that Jesus already died for you to have. You don't have to talk God into doing something good for you. He is good, and that's all He wants to do is something good for you. But you do have to get into agreement with God. And if you're thinking a bunch of junk that the devil's putting in your head all the time... And Believing lies, if you're living deceived, then although Jesus died a very painful death so you could have a great life, you're not going to experience that great life. The Bible says in Romans 12 too, that you must have your mind renewed. Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the entire renewal of your mind. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says we are to, that we're in a war. That the war that we're fighting is not a natural war. It's a spiritual war. And that Satan tries to build strongholds in our minds. And that we are to cast down wrong thoughts, wrong imaginations, reasonings and theories that war against the true knowledge of God's word. You can't know when the devil's lying to you if you don't know the word. Did you hear me? You cannot know when the devil is lying to you if you don't know the word. And irregardless of what anybody wants to think or how judgmental anybody wants to be, we don't just try to push books and tapes and videos and CDs off on you just so we can make some money. The word of God is what has changed my life and it's what's going to change your life. Anybody who's trying to teach anybody anything always offers them information on tape. <laughs> and you need to be listening to tapes when you're getting ready in the morning, when you're driving in your car. All these times that I guess are maybe what I would call downtime. In other words, you're doing something that you need to do, but it's, it's not something that would hinder you from also listening to some good music or some good teaching. And especially when you're having a war going on in your mind. Boy, that's the primary time to put on one of those tapes or good music CDs. Because if you're feeding something else into your mind, then the devil can't use it as a garbage dump. Hallelujah. So the mind of the flesh brings every kind of misery. But the mind of the spirit... is life and peace, both now and forever. 
We have two minds. Go to Romans 13, 14. A few pages over. Or it'll be up on the overhead for you. I'm going to... I want you to listen to the, to the amplified version of this from the Amplified Bible. Which, by the way, I probably should let you know that we're in the process right now. We, we were able to get the rights from Zondervan to do the first ever Amplified Study Bible. And so that's going to be coming out next, next spring or fall. It's going to be just loaded full of my teaching notes, my personal teaching notes, and and different explanations about different scriptures and life points. and just I, I'm really, really pleased about it. But clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ the Messiah and make no provision for indulging the flesh. Here's what the Amplified says. This is how we make provision for the flesh. Put a stop to thinking about the evil cravings of your physical nature to gratify its desires and lusts. So, so let me just say it another way. Put on Christ and stop making a way for the flesh to rule you by thinking about all of its evil cravings. Because when you do that, you open a door for the flesh to be gratified. In other words... If I keep thinking about what somebody's done to me that isn't fair, and I think about it, and I think about it, and I think about it, and I think about it. Now, let me tell you the truth. There is absolutely no way when I get around that person that I can treat them right. And even if I manage to keep my mouth shut, they're going to see it in my body language, or they're going to see it from the look on my face. That's why we have to forgive and forgive quickly and we need to meditate on love scriptures. Here's one scripture that you should commit to memory and meditate on it. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength and you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Or how about Matthew 13, 34? One new commandment I give unto you that you love one another just as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Church, we gotta walk in love. And you're not going to walk in love if you don't first have loving thoughts. Where the mind goes, the man follows. We prepare ourselves for action by the thoughts that we have. Now, of course, if you've missed the rest of the weekend, you've missed probably the most important point in this teaching series, which is, irregardless of what you have thought in the past, you can choose your own thinking and you can choose to think something on purpose. You don't have to just think and meditate on everything that falls in your head. If something comes into your mind that is not according to the word of God, that you know full well is going to poison your life and is not what Jesus would think in that situation, you can say, no, I'm not going to think that. And you can purposely think something else. You need to be careful how you think about yourself. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. You need to be very careful how you think about other people. You need to be very careful how you think about your future. Because what you're thinking now is what you're going to live tomorrow. Come on, church. Put a stop to thinking that causes you to walk in the flesh. You know, when you get born again, your mind is not born again. Did you know that? You get born again, you go look at yourself in the mirror, you still look the same way. You can receive Christ as your Savior, and unless you work with the Holy Spirit to renew your mind, you'll still think the same old junk you used to think. Matter of fact, you can be born again, still think the same old junk, do a lot of the same things. Now, I believe a person's truly born again that you're going to see changes in their life because I think there has to be fruit. But your, your, your behavior is not going to change very much if you don't change your thinking. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 4, 
that we must have our minds and our attitudes renewed daily. You know what that means? Every day, I've got to control my mind, discipline my mind, and train my mind. Every day, 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 every day. You know, it's great to exercise your body, to discipline your body, but you need to also discipline your mind. Don't let your mind just run rampant and do whatever it wants to. See, you may think just because those thoughts are private and they're on the inside of you that it doesn't really matter. But that's the biggest pack of lies the devil's ever told anybody because first of all, God is a God of hearts. And he said, if you look on a woman and you think about her in a wrong way, it's no different than if you've already committed adultery with her. The Bible says, if you hate your brother, it's no different than murdering your brother. Come on now. Say, my thoughts are very important. You know, we all have high points in our walk with God. When I was filled with the Spirit in 76, that was a high point for me. When God taught me the importance of, of seeking Him for who He is and not for what He can do for me, that was a life-changing thing for me. Don't ever just try to use God to get everything you want. You come to him because he is. And he's awesome. You can't live without him. And just one little tiny moment in his presence is worth more than a thousand years somewhere else. And another high point in my walk with him was when he taught me the importance of the inner life. You see, I think that a lot of people go their whole Christian life and they're only concerned with how they look. See, that was how the religious Pharisees were. And boy, Jesus really had some tough things to say to those Pharisees. He said, you put on a good show, you tithe, you attend all the right meetings, you observe all the religious holidays, but inside, Inside, you're full of wickedness and evil thoughts and judgments, and you think you're better than other people. <laughs> Come on now. We have to be so careful of our thinking. The devil's always trying to get us to criticize and judge and find fault. And even though it doesn't always come out of our mouth, how often do we look at somebody doing something and in our pride think, well, I would never. See, we need to learn to recognize those things because what Satan's doing is he's trying to build a stronghold of cold love in our heart. For we have a hardness in our heart toward other people. The Word of God teaches us that we're to be merciful and long-suffering and gentle and that we're to work to bring restoration to people and that we should not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to, but we should think about ourselves according to the grace gifts that's on our life. You know, if somebody else in your family or a friend of yours is real slow and it takes them a long, long time to do everything and you're one of these real quick people, fast. It's so easy to get irritated. What? Oh, I can't believe you are so slow. Well, you know what? If God wouldn't have given you a grace gift to comprehend things quicker, you'd be slow too. So instead of judging somebody else, we need to thank God for the gift on our life and we need to look for the gift in their life because you may be able to do something they can't do, but if you look long enough, you'll find there's something they can do that you can't do. And usually people that are a little slower do it a little better than the people that do it fast. We get it done and get it over with, but sometimes we miss the details. Hallelujah. Ooh, I'm preaching good today, I can tell. Don't you like the way I encourage myself if nobody else is? Well, let's talk about some of the various conditions that our mind can be in and try to get around to what's normal and how we think Jesus would have been thinking. Because you know, the Bible does say in 1 Corinthians 2.16 that we have the mind of Christ. Say, I have the mind of Christ. 
The Amplified says we do hold the thoughts, feelings, and intents of his heart. So in my mind of the Spirit, I have the ability to think like Jesus would think in every situation. But one of the things that we must do, and boy, our society is fighting against us. The devil is using our society to fight against us. We need to slow down. And we need to slow down so we can discern things. So we can learn to think in the spirit and we can take a minute to check with our heart and ask ourselves, is this really what Jesus would do? And no matter how we feel about it, we need to choose to line our thoughts, our words, and our behavior up with the Word of God. Can I tell you something? What I just described, what I just described to you right there is what it means to die to self. Paul said, I die daily. He said, it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. In the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Jesus said, any man that's going to follow me must take up his cross and do so. He must forget himself, lose sight of himself and all of his own interests and follow me. That's what spiritual maturity is. That's what it means to die to self. And let me tell you something, if you really want to live, then you've got to die. <laughs> See, Jesus died and had a resurrection. Well, we're not talking about a physical dying and a spiritual resurrection. We're talking about right here in this earth, dying to self and selfishness and the mind of the flesh and all the junky stuff the flesh wants to do so you can have the real life that Jesus died to give you. Hating people is not a real life. Being jealous is not a real life. Being critical is not a real life because you're full of poison. We can go to church and we can jump around with everybody else and we can know how to quote all the right scriptures at the right time. But if we are full of junk inside, then we have a poisoned life. And in a moment when we least expect it, that miserable thing on the inside of us will creep its way out and show itself when we would rather it would stay hidden. Let's go back. Use your holy imagination. Dave's hurt my feelings. Now, this, this is an imagination. <laughs> Poor Dave, he gets picked on so bad. Let's say Dave's hurt my feelings. Well, I just can't believe. I just can't believe he didn't even bother to go out and get me his name my birthday. I just can't believe. I can't believe he forgot this our anniversary. I just can't believe that he doesn't realize that I've been working so hard and I need him to do something. I just can't. Well, I can think about that and think about that and think about that. And the more I think about that, the more miserable I'm going to get. The more sour I'm going to get. The more prune-faced I'm going to get. But if I'll just take a minute and say, how would Jesus handle this situation? Well, you know, we know the answer. How I many of you know you already know the answer? See, we're not as dumb as we like to pretend like we are. And you know what we have? We have selective hearing. We hear what we want to hear from God, and then what we don't want to hear from God, we act like we can't hear from God. You got to get rid of selective hearing and start hearing everything that God has to say. Well, just stop. Okay, Lord, I'm miserable. I'm feeling depressed. I'm feeling discouraged. What's wrong? Oh, it's my thoughts. Let's don't be like the Israelites who murmured and grumbled and complained so long that the Lord finally sent fiery burning serpents into the camp and they bit the people and the people died. 23,000 of them fell dead in one day because of their stupid attitude. Now they get a revelation. <laughs> Let's don't be the kind of people that, that we've got to lose our job and lose our families and lose our friends and lose our health before we wake up and say, oh, I've sinned. Get it when God's convicting you down here. 
Do you know what? I don't believe that God ever has to send a person into our life to confront us and correct us that he has not first tried to correct us himself in the spirit. And if we won't receive private correction from God, then he will correct us publicly. I see all you guys. I even see that one woman way up there in that section all by herself. Come on, wave at me, sister. See, y'all think I don't pay attention, but I know where you're at. Oh, I tell you, you don't know how much that I wish somebody would have sat me down and told me what I'm telling you the first year I got saved. So I wouldn't have had to have wasted about 25 years of my life wandering around in the wilderness trying to make an 11-day trip. <laughs> Going around and around and around the same stupid mountain. All them, oh, God, I just don't understand God. <laughs> I don't, you know, if you just make the devil leave me alone, I rebuke you, Satan, I rebuke you. You are you, you. Oh God, I just don't understand God. What's wrong? Well, you know what, Lord? I just can't go on like this anymore. That's it. I just give up. That's it. I just can't even do this whole thing. <laughs> you think I ever impressed God one time with that? No. <laughs> There's only one thing that moves God, and that's faith and obedience. There's only one thing that moves God, and that's when we're speaking His Word out of our mouths. So I stop for a minute, and I think, okay, Dave's hurt my feelings, and blah, 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 and he should have this and that, and he didn't, and whatever. So now what am I going to do? What would you do, Jesus? Oh. Oh, yeah. Believe the best. I'm sure he didn't even realize what he was doing. I know. Women are emotional. Men are logical. I know Dave loves me. I know he's good to me. I know he wouldn't hurt my feelings for anything. I, I know. Go out and talk to him. Put my arms around him. Be friendly. I know, Lord. Don't waste the whole day. Don't act dumb. I know. You know what? We don't have a problem with knowing. You know where our problem's at? Doing. Because now here, I can know what God wants me to do, but in order to go do it, my flesh has to die. Doesn't it just give you the creepy crawlies when God makes you go talk to somebody you're mad at? Or how about this when the Lord says, well, why don't you just go and apologize and make things right? I didn't do anything. <laughs> but Joyce Matthew 5, 8 says that the peacemakers, the makers and the maintainers of peace are the sons of God. If you really want to walk in spiritual maturity, then you won't worry about whose fault it is. You'll just go make peace. Couldn't you just once in a while go talk to him? Do you always have to talk to me? I remember moaning and complaining one time and I said to the Lord, why is it that you're always requiring all this stuff out of me and I see so many other people just walking in the flesh and getting by with it? And you know what he said to me? Look. You've asked me for a lot. Do you want it or not? Oh, well, uh, mm, yes, well. How many of you know God can put you in your place really quick? And see, some of you, you've asked God for a lot. Well, do you want it or not? If you do, then you're going to have to walk a cut above what everybody else might do and get by with. And I'm telling you the truth, just to get from where God's speaking to you to the other room where that person's at. Now, am I telling the truth? I mean, I've started for the room and went out to the kitchen. <laughs> Think I need a drink of water, Lord. Isn't it ridiculous how strong the flesh is? 
that stubbornness, that rebellion, that I'm going to do it my way, it's not fair. <laughs> but we got to die to live. You see, I used to walk in all that stuff and I'd go to church on Sunday and I even had my little ministry, but behind closed doors at home. And you know what the Bible says in Luke 12? One day, everything that's hidden behind closed, do closed doors is gonna be brought out in the open and shouted on the rooftops. Someday, we're all gonna stand before God and give an account of our lives. I'm not gonna give an account for Dave or my kids or my in-laws or my outlaws or my neighbors or my boss. I'm gonna give an account of my life. And I only wanna hear one thing. Well done. Well done. Oh, we always think if we humble ourselves, then people are going to take advantage of us. Well, we're looking at it wrong. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that in due time, he may exalt you. Oh, I tell you, preaching is too much fun. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the various conditions our mind can be in, decide what would be right or wrong. Let's see, should we have a wandering mind, a mind that just wanders all over the place, or should we have a focused mind? You see, you can sit there and look at me, and while you're here, you can go get a hamburger. You can go home and check out your house and wonder how big of a mess it's going to be in when you get home. You can think about what you're going to eat this afternoon. The whole time. See, I, I realized one time, just because your body's there, that doesn't mean you're there. And the society that we live in today, because there's so much information coming at us so fast. I mean, there's like millions of images that come in front of us. In a very short period of time, between internet and radio and television and billboards driving down the highway. You know, there are certain areas of certain states, like there's a place in Dallas, Texas, a certain little township where they won't let them have billboards. And of course, that aggravates everybody, but you know it's interesting how much more peaceful it is to drive through that town. Because you actually can drive and see the beauty that God's created. It's not, get one of these and have one of those. You've got to have one of these. and one of these. Oh, wow, boy, that, I never saw that. Man, boy, I need one of those. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, I figured out now on some television programs, every eight minutes, they have a five-minute commercial. And during that five minutes, they might advertise six or seven different things. And I watched several ads last night. I couldn't even figure out what they were advertising. I mean, we got information overload, I'm telling you. I encourage you to start disciplining your mind. Start keeping your mind on what you're doing and stay focused. So many people's minds that they just jump around all over the place. You sit down, you try to pray and have a little quiet time with God and you think of 50 things you need to do and should have done and didn't do and could have done. So why don't we think of those things when it's time to do them? You ever wonder about that? It's amazing the help we get at the wrong time. Ecclesiastes 5.1, interestingly enough, says that we're to train ourselves to give our mind to what we're doing. I've found out that when I pay attention to what I'm doing, my power and excellence increases. Do you know, and I've tested this, you go home and test it. I write a lot, and if I'm writing and thinking about something else, my handwriting starts to get real sloppy. But if I purpose to concentrate on what I'm writing and pay attention to every letter, my handwriting gets really pretty. If I'm trying to fix my hair and I pay attention to what I'm doing, I end up with a better hairdo than if I'm fixing my hair and worrying about tomorrow. Anybody here today? So try to learn how to train your mind. That may take us the rest of our life, but at least it's a goal to work on. Don't have a, a wandering mind. Talk to your kids. Listen to me. How about an anxious and a worried mind? Should we have an anxious and a worried mind or should we have a peaceful mind? 
Well, what's the answer to worry? I really believe that we have to just understand the uselessness of worry. All it does is give you headaches, ulcers, neck aches, back aches, and makes you grouchy and hard to get along with. Worry does not one bit of good. It does no good. Talk to yourself a little bit. Take yourself off in a corner and have a talk with yourself. Okay, Joyce, you got this situation. Worrying about it is not going to help it. Just knock it off. Go do something good for somebody. Go listen to some music. Go listen to a tape. But don't waste your day worrying because it's not going to help a thing. Okay, Lord, now I feel better. Go preach a message to yourself. Amen. Go to Philippians 4. You're still with me, right? Come on, we got 27 minutes left. I want you to get this. We're going to count this down today. Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. <laughs> but, what can we do instead of worrying? In every circumstance and in everything, by prayer and petition, definite request, with thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to God. So what can I do when I have a problem and my mind wants to start to worry? Well, I can choose not to worry and instead I can just begin to thank God for everything that I can think of that I've got that I need to be thankful for. I can interrupt those wrong, worrisome thoughts by listening to a good teaching tape or some good music. Instead of sitting in a chair somewhere and just worrying my head off, I can actually get up and go do something nice for somebody else. We need to start fighting for our life and fighting for our peace. Verse 7, and then God's peace will be yours. Verse 8 says, and for the rest, brethren, whatever is true, worthy of reverence, honorable, seemly, just, pure, lovely, lovable, kind, winsome, and gracious, if there's any virtue or any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on and weigh and take account of these things. The Amplified Bible says, fix your minds on them. Awesome. And then we know that Matthew 6, 34 says, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will have sufficient trouble of its own. So you have to understand that whatever's coming up tomorrow, you don't have the grace yet for tomorrow. Just like God gave the Israelites their manna for one day at a time, and if they tried to get tomorrow's today, it would get rotten and stink. God's not going to give us the strength today that we need tomorrow. He doesn't even often give us the answers today that we need for tomorrow. When we look down the road, we think, how in the world am I going to do that? See, this is what faith is all about. We need to build another new building. Well, good night. We just got finished with a building four years ago. And I was in a building project and receiving offerings for buildings and believing God for the money for that building for about five or six years. And boy, was I happy when it was done. Now they come to us about six months ago and said, we need to tell you that we've only got room for about 20 more people in this building. What? <laughs> well, you better just find some place to put them because if you think I'm building another building, you've got another thing coming. <laughs> I am not going to start all over again and start taking building offerings for another five years. <laughs> well, then after I calmed down, they said, well, you got two choices. You can either not grow anymore, or you can build a building. Well, you know what? Because of the type of building this is, it's going it's to house all of our media. It's going to be an extremely expensive building because of all the technology that has to be in that building. But you know what? One of the big mistakes that people in ministry make, they get left in the dust because they don't prepare for the future. And I have a media ministry and I have to stay cutting edge so my program doesn't start to look old and antiquated and outdated and just take on an old time religious look. Because like it or not, we're living in a generation that's not really impressed by that. And we don't ever compromise the message. 
We don't ever compromise our morals, but we do have to present the gospel in a package that is relevant to the generation we're living in. Amen? I can sit around and yak about the good old days all I want to, but the fact is, is that I'm 62, and let's say I live to be in my 90s. Well, you know, there's a whole other generation coming up behind us, and sometimes we don't care enough about the younger generation, and we don't work to leave a legacy for them. Well, now, you want to know what my mind does when I think about this building? My son said yesterday, when are you going to start receiving offerings for the building? I said, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, you got to start soon. We're already starting to get in bills for blueprints and stuff. <laughs> and you know why I feel that way? Because that's not here yet. And you know what? When the time comes and I take that step of faith, you know what will happen? God's anointing will come on it. He'll open up people's hearts to give. They'll want to get involved. They'll see the vision. And we'll be putting ourselves in a position where three years from now we can grow. You know what my family's really trying to do? Because Dave and I are getting older and we're not stupid, you know, we still feel great and, you know, we got a lot of energy, but we can't continue to run all over the world all of our life. Sooner or later, we're going to have to try to minister from a, a stationary place a little bit more. And so what we want to do is build a television studio that will house about 250 guests so our partners can come from all over the world and be right there with us and we can do our TV programs in front of those audiences. Won't that be fun? Amen. But you know, here's the mistake that people make. They don't make plans for the things ahead. They don't think ahead for what they're going to need in the future. And then all of a sudden it's the future and they get left in the dust because they didn't make any plans. Well, you know what? I would rather not have to build that building, but I've got one or two choices. I can stop growing or I can build the building. So, you know, sometimes we don't want to do things, but we just got to suck it up and go on and do what we know we need to do and get over how we feel about it. But when I look out there, man, I could get worried, I could get upset, I could get frustrated, but I've had enough experience with God to know that even though I don't know how I'm going to get the money, God knows. He's got a plan. And so here's what I have to do. Step one, we're having blueprints drawn. Step two, we'll get a price on the building. Then we'll faint. Then we'll finally get over it and we'll look back at Egypt and then knowing us, we'll go, okay. You know what I found out? Once you're in over your head, it don't matter how much deeper you go. And I've been over my head so long. I mean, if God didn't help me, I'd have been dead a long time ago. So it doesn't do you any good to worry about the things that you don't understand yet and you don't have provision for because that's what trust is all about. Trust means that we always have questions that we don't have the answers to. Is there anybody here today that's got some questions and no answers? Well, then you've got two choices. Only two. You can worry or you can trust God. There's no options in between. You've got two choices. You can worry and you can try to figure out in your brain, that mind of the flesh, how you're going to provide for yourself or you can trust God. And by trusting God, you open yourself up to his miracle working power. I don't know. Maybe somebody will hear me talking about this on television. You'll come and say, you know what? You have really changed my life. I'm going to build that building for you. <laughs> Why not? That sounds like a good idea. Come on. Woo. You never know. It could happen. You can't do big things and think little. Get over your stinking little thinking. 
little bitty people with little bitty lives and little bitty thoughts and little bitty dreams and shriveled up little grouchy fault-finding miserable people. This is the way we go to church. This is the way we go to church. Oh, yuck, yuck, yuck. You gotta think big, have big plans, have big dreams. Expect God to do great things in your life. Then some people say, well, you know, I'm afraid to do that because I might get disappointed. Well, you're already disappointed. <laughs> Whoo, Jesus, I'm having fun. How about a wondering mind, a reasoning mind, a mind that's always got to try to figure everything out? You know, God had to show me in my life and this took place a good number of years ago, but he said, Joyce, you are addicted to reasoning. I mean, I could not settle down until I thought I had everything figured out. I mean, my mind would just jump on something and chew it to pieces. And then finally, when I thought I had it figured out, I, you know what God told me one time? He said, you think you've got all this stuff figured out? You don't know nothing. I want you to go to Matthew 16. I'm going to show you something pretty funny. Matthew 16, we're going to begin in verse 1. Now the Pharisees and the Sadducees came up to Jesus, and they asked him to show them a sign, a spectacular miracle from heaven, attesting to his divine authority. Now, you know, as we're reading, let, let, let's just try to put ourselves in this place, this time in history, and imagine that we're there with Jesus. We've been seeing the miracles. We've been with him when he fed the 5,000. We were with him when he fed the 4,000. We were there when he raised Lazarus from the dead. <laughs> and he replied to them, well, when it's evening, you say, it'll be fair weather for the sky is red, and in the morning it'll be stormy today for the sky is red and has a gloomy and a threatening look. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and a morally unfaithful generation craves a sign, but no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And then he left them and he went away. <laughs> and when the disciples got to the other side of the sea, they discovered they forgot to bring any bread. <laughs> you didn't get it. Only dumb people would be in a situation like that and only be concerned about lunch. Jesus is talking to them about eternal things. Wonderful secrets in the spirit. And they said, oh man, we forgot our lunch. Whoa. <laughs> now Jesus said, he just goes on trying to teach. So he's using this example now of the bread, and he says, well, be careful and be on your guard against the leaven and the ferment of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, he was trying to talk to them about religious hypocrisy. And they still got their mind on lunch. And they reasoned among themselves. They reasoned among themselves. They got into the mind of the flesh, and they tried to figure out what is going on here. And they said, well, now, did he say that because we forgot to bring any bread? And he says, oh, <laughs> Jesus, aware of this, said, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? <laughs> I 
Can't you just imagine some of the conversations that we sit around and have? I can just see it right now. If you don't pay attention to what I'm getting ready to say right now, some of you will leave this place after being here all weekend in the glory of God and hearing all this wonderful stuff about your mind, and you will stop for lunch somewhere on the way home with your friends, and you could possibly have the dumbest conversation that ever existed. <laughs> and I'm sure Jesus would be standing right by saying, Oh, you men of little faith, why are you worried about that? Did you not watch me fill 3,000 people with the Holy Spirit? Did you not watch me save 381 sinners? Did you not feel my glory in this place? Did you not feel the fire in your heart when Joyce talked about my promises? But what about lunch? <laughs> Come on, is this making sense? Get out of your head and get in to the Spirit. Quit living in your brain. Stop thinking it to death and start believing God. Have some faith. Have some discernment. Remember that the same God who parted the Red Sea is living on the inside of you. Remember the same God who shook the jail cell that Paul and Silas was in and threw open those prison doors is living on the inside of you. The same God that was in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is living on the inside of you. You know, we can shout when Candy sings, he'll do it again. But what about remembering that when we're home alone in the midnight hour? That's where this has got to work. It's not working at all if it's only working in the meeting. <laughs> Do you not yet discern, perceive, and understand? <laughs> Do you not remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many small hand baskets you gathered up? Nor do you remember the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many large provision baskets you took up? Well, then how is it that you failed to understand that I was not talking to you about bread? <laughs> but I was telling you to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We have to be so careful what we get our mind on. We can stay so much in the flesh. And all it does is make us miserable. I want you to leave here today determined that you're going to start thinking in the Spirit. And you're going to start thinking with the mind of the Spirit. And you know something you can do? And I mean, this will work if you'll do it. What would Jesus do in this situation? What would He think? Is this a godly thought? Is this really the way God wants me to look at this? How does He want me to respond to this? Or when the devil's lying to you. This doesn't happen to me much anymore because I've got a lot of experience with God now. You know, the more experience you get with God, the easier it is to trust in situations. But you know, there was a time in my life in ministry when if I was preaching and two or three people got up and left before I was finished, I mean, I just would be totally convinced I had a stinking rotten message and they didn't like me. And, you know, I'd be miserable all day. And now I figure if they leave and didn't like me, it's their loss because I believe I'm hearing from God. And I don't mean that in a sarcastic way, but you've got to get to that point where you don't let how everybody responds to you dictate to you whether you're on target or not. Otherwise, the devil can always find somebody to frown at you at the wrong time. One time I finished a meeting and, I mean, the devil was pounding on me. This was no good. We should have never done it, blah, 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 blah. And the Lord just challenged me. He said, why don't you just stop that and just... Check with your heart. Oh. And you know, the minute that I looked in my heart, I thought, you know what? This is what God told us to do. We did it the best we know how to do it. He doesn't expect anything else. I believe he'll take it and bless people's lives with it. Then you can go on and enjoy your life. If you stay in your head, you're going to be miserable. But if you get in the spirit, you can have life and soul peace. 
And there's so many other areas I could talk to you about a confused mind or a clear and a decisive mind. Begin to make decisions. No decision is still a decision you're deciding not to decide. Don't worry so much about missing God. If you miss him, he'll find you. Don't have a selfish mind. Instead, have a loving mind. One of my favorite scriptures is Galatians 6, 6, 10. It says, be mindful, be mindful to be a blessing, especially to those of the household of God. You make your mind up that you're going to be a blessing. You don't have to wait to have three trumpet blasts and two prophecies and four angels appear to you before, before you go do a good deed. Why do we think we've got to have a word from heaven to give away an extra 10 bucks? You know why? Because we really don't want to give our 10 bucks away and we want God to prove to us that it's him before we let go of it. Well, now God, if this is really you, come on, I know, I've been down that road. Now God, if this is really you, you know, the Lord said to me one day, you know, Joyce, even if it's not really me, I won't get mad at you if you bless somebody, just take your liberty, go right ahead. You don't even have to get my permission to be a blessing. That's what I've created you to be. Just get about doing it. Well, Lord, I don't know. Do you want me to become a partner with choice or not? Oh, God, I need a sign from heaven. But I don't know, Lord, partner. Oh, I need three confirmations. God, you give me three confirmations and I'll become a partner. No, it doesn't have to be that complicated. Joyce is blessing me. The word she preaches changed my life. I want to bless her. I'm going to be a partner. And then you go out there and the line is long and the devil says, uh, you, you don't want to wait that long. You can do it another time. And you say, nope, I'm standing right here and I'm going to do what God told me to do because I stand in line to get other stuff I want and this is important to me too. The last thing I'll tell you, I may want to hear the last thing I'm going to tell you. The last thing I want to tell you is be very, very careful how you think about yourself. Do not go around with a sin consciousness all the time, but have a righteousness consciousness. Yes, we sin and we do things wrong on a regular basis. But the Bible says that through the blood of Christ, we have been completely cleansed and that we stand righteous before God, clothed not in our own righteousness, but his. The only righteousness that is acceptable to him is his own, and he's given it to us so he can fellowship with us. I forget if it was Thursday night or Friday morning that I told the little story about, I think it was Thursday night when I talked about you know, I'd made two mistakes that day that I could remember. I was impatient with somebody and I wasn't as merciful as I should have been. And I found myself just thinking about those two things and feeling bad about those two things. And the Lord challenged me. He said, why do you always think about the two things you do wrong instead of the 150 things you've done right today? Well, I don't know if that would be right. Well, is there anywhere in the Bible where it tells you to just go around all the time thinking about everything you did wrong? It says to take an inventory and whatever you've done wrong, lift it up to God, get over it, and go on. Letting go of what lies behind and pressing on to the good things that are ahead. And I'm not suggesting you just sit around and wallow in all your own goodness. Oh, I'm so good. I was such a blessing. But you know, you can say things like, you know, I'm making progress. I may not be where I need to be, but I'm on my way. I'm making a journey. I love God. I'm improving. I don't act nearly as bad as I used to. My heart's right. And you know what? In that situation, I didn't get mad like I would have before. In this situation, I was a lot more generous than I would have been five years ago. And even though I did lose my patience in this situation, I realized it right away. And I was able to repent and ask God to forgive me. So my heart is not as hard as it used to be. I'm getting really sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Come on. Hallelujah. So you're going to have better thoughts about your life, the people around you, your future, everything that God has for you.
is just waiting for you to line your mind up with God's will for your life. Let's all stand up together. Love you. This concludes this message. Thank you for listening. For more information about Joyce Meyer Ministries or to request a free catalog, please contact us on the Internet.